I invited Scotty to, to do the joke, but he declined. Scotty likes to tell jokes. As a crowded airliner is about to take off, the piece is shattered by a five-year-old boy who picks that moment to throw a wild temper tantrum. No matter what his frustrated, embarrassed mother does to try to calm him down, the boy continues to scream furiously and kick the seats around him. Suddenly, from the rear of the plane, an elderly man in a uniform of an Air Force general is seen slowly walking down the aisle, stopping the flustered mother with an upraised hand. The white-haired, courtly, soft-spoken general leans down and motioning toward his chest, whispers something into the boy's ear. Instantly, the boy calms down, gently taking his mother's hand, quietly fastening his seatbelt. All the other passengers burst into spontaneous applause. As the general makes his way back to his seat, one of the cabin attendants touches his sleeve. Excuse me, general, she asks, but could I ask you what magic words you used on that little boy? The old man smiles serenely and gently confides. I showed him my pilot's wings, service stars, and battle ribbons, and explained that they entitled me to throw one passenger out the plane door on any flight that I choose. <laughs> it's not a true story. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Second Chronicles 20 and 15 says this. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Would you bow your heads, dear Lord, we thank you this morning that we have the word that you have given it to us, that you spoke it into the, into the, with inspiration into the hearts of the writers, and that we have it today and we can depend on it, we can hear it and read it, Lord. So we thank you for this opportunity to bring this portion of the word into the family in the house today and ask that you would add a blessing to it in Jesus' name, amen. So tomorrow we celebrate the brave people who gave their lives in service of this nation. I mean, you have Veterans Day when you celebrate everyone who is willing to do that. And originally this was called Decoration Day, meaning they decorated the graves in the cemeteries of those who actually were casualties in war, who gave their life, you know, for this nation, for our freedom. It was instituted around the time of the Civil War. There's different theories of when it actually started. And it's not in stone when that actually happened. But, and there are a lot, of, a lot of theories and different locations about when um, Decoration Day, which became Memorial Day, when it came about. One of them is in Bowlesburg, Pennsylvania. On July 4th, 1864, ladies decorated soldiers' graves according to a local historian in, a, in Bowlesburg, Pennsylvania. Bowlesburg promotes itself as the birthplace of Memorial Day. However, no reference to this event existed until the printing of the history of the 148th Pennsylvania Volunteers in 1904 in a footnote to a story about her brother, Mrs. Sophie Hall, described how she and Emma Hunter decorated the grave of Emma's father, Reuben Hunter. The original story did not account for Reuben Hunter's death according to um, two months later on September 19th, 1864. It did not mention Mrs. Elizabeth Myers as one of the original participants. However, a bronze statue of all three women gazing upon Reuben Hunter's grave now stands near the entrance to the Bullsburg Cemetery 
although July 4th, 1864 was a Monday, the town now claims that the original decoration was on one of the Sundays in October, 1864. So that's one claim of when it originated. And there, I, in this research, I found there are many, many claims. Well, that's a good thing because there are many, many people and events that were honoring those who gave their lives in defense of our freedom. And I ran across this list of different wars and how many military deaths there were. Revolutionary War, 4,435. 4, and I'm not going to read all these, but the Civil War, this is incorrect. It said 498,000, but actually I think the historians figure there were over 600,000. And that's the most casualties that we've ever had in any war. World War II, 405,399. In the Vietnam, 90,220. In the Persian Gulf War, 1,565 which is all too many. But we honor the people who died in service of this nation to preserve our freedom. And so it's right that we honor them, that we honor them. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't have a direct ancestor that I know of who died in defense of the nation. Do any of you? Who is it? Paul Coons. Paul And what war was he in that he died in? World War II. Any others? We want to mention them and honor them. Any others? I had, a, I had an uncle died over in the Normandy invasion in the Army. In World War II. Yeah. I have a friend died in the Vietnam. He drowned up there with a whole bag of things. Jimmy Rivers. Jimmy Richards. Wow. What a way to go. That was uh, Jimmy Richards in 1968. Any others? I, my great grandfather was in the Civil War and he survived it, but he was a prisoner at Andersonville. If you know anything about Andersonville prison in the Civil War. That was just like the Nazi concentration camps. Multiple people starved, and it's a, it's a miracle that he survived it, but he did. And I never knew him, but, you know, we just need to honor those people. Freedom always has a cost. We haven't been in the last war, the last person to give their life. That hasn't happened yet, but it will. And every conflict has an enemy. Every conflict has an enemy. The Bible has a lot of conflicts. There are a lot of wars and a lot of enemies spoken of in the Bible. All the way back to the conflict that caused Satan to be kicked out of heaven and take a third of the angels with him. Satan is the god of this world. He's been causing trouble and stirring up conflict ever since. You could call him the father of conflict. Humans have had conflict as long as we've been on the planet. Cain and Abel. Um, the violence that filled the earth in Noah's time. Abraham went to war against five kings to rescue Lot. We have conflict because of greed, because of jealousy, because of ideologies, because of anger and hatred. And where do those things come from? Satan himself. Hatred boiled over onto the streets in many of our cities last summer. Hatred, rage. Real peace is only going to become, only going to come when Jesus returns. That's when the conflict will stop and real peace will come. Meanwhile, warfare and conflict will continue. Personal conflict and struggles are common to us all. You don't have to be in a battle with somebody or in a war. Well, we are in a war. 
But if you haven't been in a war defending the country, you have been in a war, and maybe you know it, or maybe you don't know it, but the war is there. There's a spiritual battle and warfare going on between the enemies of God and the saints and the believers all the time. King David was in a lot of conflict. He was a warrior. War was a way of life to King David. He started out just as a shepherd boy and his brothers all went to war against the Philistines and his job, he was trusted to take care of the flocks. And you all know how it was that David thrust himself into a righteous conflict with Goliath the champion of the Philistines and how it was that he killed Goliath and won a great victory. Then he got into a conflict with King Saul. David had a lot of conflicts and he had a lot of victories. One of his most tragic conflicts was when his own son tried to take the kingdom away from him. It all started when a son of David, Amnon, took an unfair advantage with the sister of Absalom, another of David's sons, and her name was Tamar. They were, they were all half-brothers and half-sisters, but Tamar was also a daughter of David, Amnon was, and Absalom. And they weren't the only ones because because Solomon was a son of David. But Absalom, whose sister was taken advantage of by Amnon, he took revenge by killing Amnon. Can you imagine the, the turmoil, emotional turmoil, going on in the father and mother when one son kills another, going all the way back to Adam and Eve. One of their cherished children kills another of their cherished children. Can you imagine the grief and the turmoil that's going on because of that conflict? And it all started as something bad. Second Samuel 13, starting in verse 30. Six, as he finished speaking, the king's sons came in, wailing loudly. The king, too, and all his attendants wept very bitterly. Absalom fled and went to Talmai, son of Amiud, the king of Geshur. But King David mourned many days for his son. After Absalom fled and went to Geshur, he stayed there three years, and King David longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Amnon's death. So far, we have rage, the rage of Amnon, the terrible I mean the rage of Absalom against Amnon, the terrible act that Amnon did. We have terrible grief. We have guilt, fear, mourning, and the king's longing to see Absalom, his son that ran away after he killed Amnon. Negative emotions can be destructive unless you learn to rise above it, and you can. Stress is harmful. You can have stress come out in aches and pains. It'll come out in a headache that won't go away. It'll come out in pain here and there. It'll come out as a knot in your stomach. It'll come out all kinds of ways. Ruth, am I right? Stress can cause all kinds of symptoms. David's stress would get worse he was to face one of the most difficult battles of his entire life. So Joab, who was the general of David's armies, he set up a ruse, a trick, to get David to allow Absalom to return to Jerusalem. 2 Samuel 14, 23 and 24. Then, then Joab went to Geshur and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. 
that was with David's permission. But the king said, he must go to his own house. He must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house and did not see the face of the king. King David had longed to see him. But the conflict was that he killed the other son. And so now he says, he can come back to Jerusalem, but he's not coming into my presence. The conflict of that rage and longing, I just can't imagine how people can live that way. But we have it in the world today. But these are conflicting emotions in one person's heart. David longs for his son, allows him to return, but won't allow him to be reunited. David's carrying a grudge against the son that he longs for. How can it be? Eventually, Absalom gained power among some of the people, and he mounted a rebellion against his father. Now he's getting revenge because his father won't see him. And David had to flee from the city because Absalom was going to kill him. So David had to run away from his own son who would have killed him. David had to run away from the son whom he longed for, but he also raged against in his heart. Had to run away to stay alive. Can you imagine these emotions? He has to escape from the son that he longed for. So how does David cope with this inner turmoil? Psalm 3 was written during this time when he fled from his son. Psalm 3 was written during that time. A Psalm of David, it says, when he fled from his son Absalom. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep, I wake again, because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your unfailing, may your blessing be on your people. David copes with these bleak circumstances and his terrible grief by going to God. I will not fear. David has faith and confidence in the ability of God to deliver him and bring him victory. David is able to rise above what he sees around him because of his faith. He rises above it. And I'm here to tell you today that you can rise above destructive emotions, things coming against you, things causing you grief and turmoil. You can, with God, rise above it, just like David did. You may never get in a situation like he was. Well, you never will, but we all have situations that try to press us down and you can rise above that stuff you really can so here's what happened David's grief wasn't over he gathered a large army in the countryside and a big battle took place and David's army won that battle Absalom was riding along in a mule through the woods and his hair he had big he had long hair his hair got caught in a tree branch and the mule he was riding on kept going, and Absalom was hanging there by his hair. And Joab and his men killed him. Um, one of the men came to Joab and said, you know, Absalom was hanging by his hair over there. And Joab said, you could have killed him. And the guy says, oh no, not me. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to kill the king's son. So Joab went over and put three spears into the heart of Absalom and then his men gathered around and struck him down and killed him. David's reaction to that 
more grief. 2 Samuel 18, 33, the king was shaken. Now Absalom was after him, after the kingdom, and was going to kill him. And Absalom is down, but the king is shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway, and he wept. As he went, he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. If only I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Grief. Can you imagine all these different emotions going on in one person's heart? But he goes, he knows exactly where to go with his overwhelming grief. Psalm 6, he writes this, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord, how long? Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? I am worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. You can go to God and tell him how bad you feel. That's what he does. He's going to God and telling him how bad he feels. But he's telling it to God and he knows that God can bring him out of that. You know, we all have... Battles, we all face battles. The longer you live, the more battles that you have faced. We have two families in our own church where children passed before their parents. And that's a terrible grief. We have someone that you trust that turns on you, causing you grief. That's a battle. You lose your job. Your business fails. You get COVID. Termites. My whole family's all afraid of termites because we're woodses. Termites. You plant a crop and you don't get any rain. Or you plant a crop and you get too much rain. The hen quits laying, the cow dries up, the well runs dry. They find cancer. All these, all these battles that we all have. The older you get, you get an ache, ache over here and a pain over here. It's amazing what you can get used to. Sometimes there's too much month left at the end of your money. Maybe the IRS wants to see you. Maybe the sheriff wants to talk to you. Pastors worry when someone leaves the church. You know, pastors take on the burdens of everyone in the church. An empathetic pastor, you know, feels for all of his people. I pray for everybody in here. Everybody. Because it's such a small church, I know what's wrong with all of you. <laughs> I know where your aches and pains are. Well, some of you. Most of you. I know where they... I know what to ask God to do. And, I, and we take those things on ourselves. But sometimes things look really bad. Can you imagine when Absalom mounted an army and was after the kingdom and David had to flee. Can you imagine? And sometimes things really are bad. Sometimes they look bad and sometimes they really are bad. If there's something that you can do about that, then do it. But a lot of times we face things that we can't do anything about. You can sink from the weight of circumstances or you can rise above it like David did. You can refuse to let it pull you down. You can go to God. Psalm 16 verse 8. Here's David writing it again. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I will not be shaken. David knew how to do it. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. This is David writing again, I lack nothing. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. In other words, all my good things come from God. He refreshes my soul. Did you ever need a soul refreshing? About every day, maybe. Some of us. Refreshes my soul. The King James restores my soul. Guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley in the King James, the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And David had been in all these places. The shadow of death. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love in the King James mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The pastor read that yesterday at Mel's celebration. But that's not a verse just for funerals. That's a verse about life and triumph. So we have battles and we have an enemy. We're in a war. We have grief. <laughs> Even Jesus experienced grief. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Matthew 23, 37. You who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. Jesus is grieved because of the death. That is the separation from God of those who were not willing who refused to believe in him. That causes him grief. He was moved to tears when his friend died. John eleven thirty two 32 to 35. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Jesus grieved. Where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. In verse 35, Jesus wept. Jesus is grieved over everyone who refuses to believe in him because they will die in their sins and his love prompted him to come and to be the sacrifice the propitiation for their sins and when they refuse he is grieved Genesis chapter 6 verse 6 the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled see grief comes God is grieved. Jesus is grieved. We're told not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Psalm 78, 40, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the wasteland. God is grieved when we turn against him. He's grieved. During World War II, my father's mother had a flag in the window. I don't know what you call those things. It was like a it had a star on it. You know, did you ever see one of those? Can it, all the people had soldiers overseas. They put them in their window. You could drive down the street and see those flags. You know what they are? Well, anyway, we have that. We found it. And we put it in a window because my son was over in Iraq. And um, he was deployed over there. And so we remember and we honor the ones that didn't come home. The loss causes grief. But the ones who don't get to go home with God grieves him because he loves them. Jesus made the way for us to get home. This isn't home. This isn't home. It's not. But Jesus made a way for us to get home. Home from the war that we're in. 
He paid the price with his own blood. When someone dies in their sins, it's a terrible tragedy. It grieves God. It grieves us. We need to pray for revival. We need to pray for souls. We need to be soul winners. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9 says this, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We will face hard things in life, but you can rise above the emotional turmoil of it. You don't have to let the circumstances keep you down emotionally. We can rise above it just like David did. The circumstances may not change. Bad things happen to good people. Cast down but not destroyed. We like the not destroyed part. We don't like the cast down part. But scripture helps. Despair and anxiety are always a part of life. But we can find strength. We can find wisdom and guidance in the encouraging words, God's word from the Bible. No matter what we face, job loss, relationship conflict, death of a loved one, or even a pandemic, there's always an opportunity to focus on God's promises. There are so many encouraging verses. These are just a few. I looked these up and I would be reading these for an hour, but I just have selected a few. John 16, 22 says, So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. No one will take away your joy. Psalm 73, 21 to 26, When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Isaiah 12, 2, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. And Romans 12, 12, Be joyful in hope. That sounds nice. Patient in affliction. Well, the affliction part doesn't sound so good. But it's just telling us that we will have these things. And faithful in prayer. There are three things right there. Joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. You could have a sermon just on those three things. So we are invited to bring all of our turmoil and trials, all of our disappointments and everything that happens that wears us down, we're invited to bring those things to God. He bids us to come. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Need rest for your soul today? You can get that from God. He's ready. He's ready. You can rise above it. You can rise above the pain. You can rise above the distractions. You can rise above it. God is waiting to just lift you out of those things. God wants you. He's inviting you. He, he bids you to bring our turmoil and our trials to Him. Our disappointments, everything that seems to want to press us down, to make us discouraged. Well, you could rise above all that just by going to God, by refreshing yourself in the scriptures. 
There are hundreds of encouraging scriptures. I just read just a short few of them in the interest of time, but God is good. He is so good. He is so good. So we keep our eyes on Him and not on the gloom and things, gloom and the things that happen around us. Our eyes on Him. He's our lifter. So I encourage you to rise above it when you have something that's causing you gloom and distress and despair. I'm, I'm encourage you to rise above it in your emotions. Go to God. Go to the Word. Victory is in there. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you bow your heads? Dear Lord, you are so awesome. So awesome to make a way for us to just have a relief, Lord God, from the things of the world that come against us and that are around us from the warfare that we fight. Help us to realize that you are there with us, Lord. That you are there. And that one day, our ultimate victory will be that we get to move in with you in heaven, Lord. This is just a very brief, transitory experience. And we thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for getting us through it. Help us, Lord, to do our part. Help us, Lord, to bring people into your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to build this church. Help us, Lord, to be in your will and to always do what you have for us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.